so much, Inez, for sharing it with us. Another uh, prolific filmmaker, Imen Kamen, is a filmmaker. She is a cultural activist. And she studied art, dance, and film at the Berlin School of Arts, always on the move. She's traveled extensively from South Africa to China. And since 1995, she's directed five short films, including one called Hologram, which was awarded by Europe in 2004. Her debut feature documentary, Nomad's Home, in Arabic, Beit Shar, received a jury special mention at the Dubai International Film Festival in 2010. From cultural diplomacy to cultural ecoplomacy. I've been practicing how to say it all day. And she'll be talking to us about the Nile Project also, a case study of three contemporary musicians, all of them women. Imen, Ken. Um, Um, to express my appreciation for Shainez to share with us this, this very, very strong uh, experience. Shainez, I believe that um, if we share all of us this journey and we speak up of it, I think this will be a real power that will really have a real impact and change. Thank you, Shainez. I wanted to use the time once again to say thank you not only for the Human Foundation, for Alia and Aisha and all behind the scenes, I wanted to thank also Shahira and I would like to give her a clap just now. Thank you. Um, Shahira told you that I'm a nomad. Um, it's not only a nomad uh, in a space, it's also a nomad in the mind, it's a nomad in the heart, it's a nomad in, in the soul. That means that there is some people in the modern life that are all the time on the quest, moving along, leaving the known behind and just move and move and move and on discovery journey all along the way. I studied um, as a filmmaker, actually. I studied last year in the Fletcher School, International Relations. I had this idea, I was so euphoric, and I had a lot of ideas about projects in Egypt. So I applied and I got this opportunity to be part of a wonderful global family, again, like the family here. And I focused my work as a cultural activist on cultural diplomacy. Of course, I was very interested in the Nile Project, and I will tell you why I was interested in the Nile Project. I just wanted to shoot first um, the video just to have a feeling. How can I do it? Can you help, please? Yes, technical help, please. Oh, it's there. Okay. I'm not a PC person, sorry. So using the time again for technical use. Um, OK, that's it. Just have a feeling for it. More sound. Sound up, sound up. Volume. Are we getting a nice dose of the mood out the front for all 
the world has taught us not to think of the Nile as one region, but rather as like, you know, you have people in North Africa, people in East Africa, people in Central East Africa, and so you, you don't see the connection that the Nile kind of gives you. Beside her, Sara from Sudan. It started with this musical curiosity. I grew up in Egypt and I was never exposed to the music of Ethiopia, which is a river neighbor to Egypt. I never was exposed to the culture of Ethiopia. I never was to become more exposed to this music. This is Al-Sara from Sudan. The joy of discovering each other's traditions makes it new. Like Discover each other's traditions. One instrument called the Inanga. And I fell, I fell in love with it the first minute I heard it. But all this time I didn't know it existed. These instruments I haven't met before, like, in, in, that, in the sense that they're meeting now. Yeah, and also like taking traditional instruments and making them do non-traditional things. We're creating a Nile sound. We're creating a full-on Nile sound, not just region, one country by one country, but like as a river. What do we sound like as a region? It's like an orchestra. Good evening. This is Vicky Tadero from Ethiopia. We are the Nile Project. We are musicians from seven of the 11 Nile Basin countries. This is the sound of our friendship. <laughs> Music, it's always an experiment in how can we make each other sound good. So everyone is on the same page. Everyone is working together towards the same goal. It's really hard to, to be able to. It's better to work with my own computer. Okay, so the Nile Project was founded in 2011. I, because of the time, and I know Shahira is um, watching the time, um, the, this project was founded in the background of a real transboundary water conflict. Um, Egypt was a hegemon in the water usage of the Nile. There was two treaties, 1929 and 1959, were supposed to be colonial treaties where Egyptian, uh, Egypt as a state was allocated 75% of the water usage of the Nile and Sudan 25%. All other repairing countries, and there are 11 repairing countries on the Nile, they didn't have any access or any usage for the water and they were not signatories, they were not signing any of these treaties. So of course, um, when Ethiopia, when all these countries have, has risen on the geopolitical area, arena, they wanted to use the water exactly like Egypt and Sudan, and they wanted to work on an agreement, on a water agreement that had two principles, uh, equity of water usage and doing no harm. But of course, Egypt has a lot of fears, and the negotiations, I worked on them during my, this, my masters, the negotiations were stalled. It was not only the interests and the polit politi political and social interests that were antagonizing, it was also the culture. It was also because we don't know anything about Ethiopia or Sudan. So the project was born out of that galvanized around professional musicians and working towards collaborations with academics and with social entrepreneurship. We heard yesterday from Julie that she tried to, sh to show us the, the complexity about the social entrepreneurship. And I started to work on a case study. I have chosen three musicians, women musicians, um, because I, Dina Gudedi from Egypt, um, Meklit Hadero from Ethiopia, she's an immigrant, she's an American Ethiopian, and El Sara, she's also an, a Sudanese and um, American citizen. 
my questions were actually, as a filmmaker or as a cultural uh, activist, I really wanted to understand um, in their work and in their life, what are the aspects for them to, to define them as agents of change? I wanted to understand what are the qualities of leadership and norm entrepreneurship. You know, like Dina Luidedi, when she decided to go on the Nile project, she actually had to question her African identity and she had to break through a barrier because we don't really work on our African identity or we say we are Egyptian. So I wanted to understand what makes them cultural diplomats. Cultural diplomacy is something that we know of very clearly. A state brings another concert or another <laughs> cultural group to another state to show them the culture, to communicate with them uh, the traditions. It's a state-to-state -state action. And I wanted to understand that that project is not belonging to any of these policy makers. It's an independent project. I wanted to understand what is going on in these three, in the lives and the work of these three musicians. Let me share with you some of the aspects of the research that was six months. So it's a, a very complex research and also multidisciplinary research. I had to work a lot about music and community. I had to work a lot about colonial and post-colonial culture. I had to work a lot about identity. I had to do a lot of work about negotiations and geopolitical aspects of our modern life. Some of the aspects that I'm trying to share with you are very important not only to show us why these singers, actually musicians, are leaders. First of these aspects were the global and local player aspect. I found out, for example, like Dina Mwedi, she's very much rooted here in Egypt. She came up also with the revolution, El Haram, everybody will know that song from Egypt. And she is keen to settle her and root herself also in Egypt. She is as a star, as a rising star, she's going to provinces in Egypt, which is not normal for stars. And she's very connected to her fans here in Egypt and in the Arab world. But uh, Dina Mudedi was the protégé of Gilberto Gil. She got a fellowship. She traveled to Brazil, actually. And she traveled with him for one year globally, learning from him. So I found out not only Dina, it was also McLeod and Ansara, they always go locally and try to root themselves and to activate their work in their spaces where they are. San Francisco for McLeod, Ansara in New York, and Dina in Egypt. But then they reach out and try to find a global context for their work. Their work is, um, very much um, characterized by polyphony, inclusion, fusion. I loved uh, the allegory of the rainbow of Charmin today. Thank you, Charmin, for this inspiration. It is very much the same. Uh, it is the acknowledgement that there are a lot of diversity, but you have to work through through to find a fusion, to find an inclusion. These singers, they would, they are so curious, they would go and, and try to find out what is the scale when they are working on the Nile project. Um, the Ethiopian scale, if you try to work on it, and then you will find, oh, some elements are Egyptian, wow. But then, oh, okay, but it is so different from the Egyptians, so what can we work on it? How can we do it? How can we make a song together? a show together as a night project. So this ambiguity, this, um, this moving between worlds, between sides, the, you know, when you are inside of a group, a religious group, a cultural group, a national group, you are an insider. But these musicians, they travel far away, so when they come back, they are regarded as outsiders. So what they do, what are these singers working on to find a balance or to find this fusion in their work? 
They call themselves the hyphen, the in-betweeners. McLeod celebrates this hyphen. She says, I'm not American, I'm not Ethiopian, I'm not a jazz musician, I'm not a modern musician, I'm not an activist, I'm not an artist, I'm always in between. This space in between is a space that builds a kind of a, a power to let something new arise. How can you be so courageous to be in that space? It can be a religious space, it can be a spiritual space, it can be a creative and artistic space. But how can I be in that space? And I found out that these singers are travelers. They are not only travelers in the space, they don't go to festivals and workshops, they are travelers also in their minds. The scholar and writer Trin Khmencha, she created a wonderful concept. Uh, she called it the female walker. Um, allow me two sentences, two elements about this concept. This concept is actually juxtaposing the male concept of occupying, you know, we know about our history, you know, Columbus go to America and he discovers that and then the indigenous people are almost I I diminished when uh, a European scholar goes to Egypt and um, discovers the, the Nofretete, then he can take her back to Berlin. Um, the female walker is very receptive. The female walker leaves her space, the, the known space, she leaves her people. She moves along the way, very fragile and very open. And also, she's very strong because she has to walk all through all these experiences. But what does she do? She discovers along the way precious experiences, um, ideas, power, braveness, but she comes back. She's the porter, she's the bridging builder. She tries to find ways between these antagonistic worlds that she's living in, the American, the Ethiopian. So what, what can we learn, or what could I learn about my research with the Nine Project? I try to find five aspects that I can share with you today uh, that also mirroring uh, all the work that we have listened to the past two days. One of the main aspects that I learned from the NAR project is the deep listening. Look, there are artists from 11 different countries. They don't know the language of each other. They don't know actually nothing from each other. They have to work together for two weeks to create a whole show that goes on a tour for four months. Okay? So what is the aspect of the deep listening? What is the, the working of the deep listening? We have this deep listening also in the corporate area. We have the deep listening everywhere. Otto Scharmer did generate another word, it's the generative listening, where a group of people work together, listen, to try to make a creative element out of the listening. The tuning of the instruments is one of these aspects, because the Krara, the Ethiopian Krara, is totally different tuned than the Egyptian Nai. So they have to work together to find one tuning for an orchestra. So they have to work back and forth. They have to work not only with their instruments, they have also to work in their minds. They have to understand where is this scale coming from. So what is going on in the Nile Project every morning? It's the learning and teaching process. They have to teach each other their skills, the language, because they have to sing it all together. They have to teach themselves the whole culture because these songs, they come from a tradition. Dina Budedi is working with Sufi dancers. She's working with a lot of traditional and folkloric elements like all her other colleagues. So they have to teach each other. They have to learn. 
in a space that is made out of two weeks. What I've understood is that the learning teaching process brings a third process, it is the relearning. They understand and try to understand what is going on with my own culture. They try to reflect on it. They try to go back and try to understand from where is this folkloric tradition came from. So the relearning is a new process that brings them and forge them forth to a new uh, creative process. The collaboration here and the leadership in the NARP project is a kind of a prototype for all kinds of collaborative leaderships. Because uh, you have in the industry, in the musician industry, you have one leader, it's the musician, but here you have different songs created by different singers. So on this song, this is the leader, on that song it's the other leader. So they have to work together because they bring one show on the stage. The co-creational process here is very much connected to what we call the, the performance, the, the, the space where something new can emerge. All of these singers, they love to perform, not only because they love their fans, also because they find that the performance is a space of communication. They want to share with their audiences not only their songs, but they want to share the whole experience because they have walked along through diverse worlds, through antagonistic worlds, like Meklichi, moving between Ethiopia and America. Dina Widedi, she's moving between Egypt and Sudan and Ethiopia. She is crossing adversary lines. The forging forward of communicational channels brings the cultural diplomacy, the classical definition of cultural diplomacy that we know, we all know of, and we know that it is a representation of a state. It's a representation of a, it's a, an official representation. They bring that cultural diplomacy to a total different area. I tried to disseminate the word culture, and I found out this, the source of it, and it is the cult. If you take all religious um, meanings out of it, it's a space where a group of people like we are during these two days, elaborating together, communicating together, being together, dancing together, meditating together, talking together all the time. It's a space where there is a power that comes forth. Julie called it the field of force. It's me that I call it also versus power because I wanted to find a way like the, you know, we know about the tsunami. That tsunami started with small waves, hundreds of miles, small waves, small waves, small waves. They gather and gather and gather and suddenly they have this tsunami-like power and force that can destroy houses and villages. So the, the, the field of force here is very much connected also the, to the oral uh, traditions. I wanted to share with you that most of these women, like uh, El Sara, she works with Arani Banat, the songs of the girls. And she found out that these songs actually performed in weddings, that they have, they bear, they carry with them a real story because these women were working they were working women, and they were telling the stories. They were telling the stories in the weddings, but they were telling the stories of their pain, their suffering, their struggle as women, because they had to work for the whole family. All of these stories were not written. They are oral, and they given from one generation to the other to the oral. And these singers, they are doing the same. They are transforming the tradition, and we had this a dialogue with Mariam, they transform, they bring this tradition from the past, they bring it towards the present and try to forge it forward in the contemporary art towards the future. It's a non-coercive knowledge. What does that mean? It means that it, it happens organically. It is like two friends talking and teaching and learning to each other. And this force, 
can really break through adversary lines, like in the Nile Project. You know, the songs of Dina Wudidi, they are heard all over the place in Ethiopia. It's amazing to see this experience. What I'm trying to bring forth here in this presentation is that the cultural diplomacy is a policy-making tool for foreign policy, for a public policy, and people who are in political science know what that means. It is an approach from up to down. And what I'm trying to show you here is a process that comes from the bottom to the up approach. It's on the grassroots level. It's artists meet artists. It's people want to be together, working together. And not only in the arts, it's working together with academics, with students, with social entrepreneurs, working all together like underground waters. And then they connect together. And the ecosystem told and taught, taught us how it works. Because the ecosystem is interconnected and interdependent. We learned in school in the 50s that the movement of a butterfly can impact a storm thousands of miles away. And I want to close my presentation with a quote from Miklit Hedero. Last month, I was on the Lake Tana in Ethiopia, the source of the Blue Nile, perched on this tiny motorboat and singing to myself, watching the clouds make their way across the sky. And I thought to myself, these clouds are the Nile in the sky. The rainfall becomes the lake, the lake becomes the river, the river becomes the sea, and all along the way, the systems that feeds this river are more broadly the systems that feed all rivers and all watersheds and all of us. We are interconnected and we want to know what that sounds like. Thank you very much.